Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees in just a moment, and I'm going to go before the Lord, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And as we do, I want to ask if you're able to stand, if you would join me in prayer and prepare your hearts to receive the, uh, the word of the Lord today. Let's all stand together. I'm going to take this coat off because I know I'm going to sweat, and I know my wife would love it. So I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's just prepare our hearts to hear the word of God today. So Father, we come into this place, and Lord, we're just so grateful. First and foremost, that we are able and given the, afforded the opportunity to come into the house of God and to worship you freely without fear of persecution here in this great country of ours. So Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you would bless this nation and bless its leaders. And Lord, we thank you that we don't come here to hear from a man or hear from a woman, the old or the young. Lord, we don't come to church for tradition or for ceremonial or ritual sake. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's our senior leader, that's the head of this church. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us today to be our counselor, would be our guidance, to be our helper, to show us the word of God as if we're reading it and we're studying it today, Lord, that it would be like a seed that is planted into good and fertile ground. The ground is our life. The seed is the word of God that we would walk out of this building, Lord, and we would bear much fruit for you and for your glory. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us here at this house and in this congregation. And Lord, we ask that you wouldn't just bless us, but bless all our brothers and sisters across the world and around the Inland Empire today that are preaching here in the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the Rock, we never Never think of ourselves as higher or better than anybody, but rather we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together for your kingdom, for your glory. So Lord, we thank you for all our brothers and sisters, our denominational brothers and sisters all across the different various denominations. Lord, we thank you for our individual churches or our non-denominational churches around the area, for Harvest and Sandals and the Grove and the Well, the Way Ecclesia. Lord, we thank you for New Life, for, for Emmanuel Baptist, for a New Creation, for Abundant Living. Lord, all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ on this blessed Sunday. Lord, we thank you that we would hear your word and receive it today. And Lord, we thank you that you would bless them, encourage them, strengthen them. Lord, we are all many members of the body of Christ working together to build your kingdom. So Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Well, praise God. As you're grabbing your seats, go ahead and get your Bible out. Get your device out. I know many of us nowadays don't carry paper anymore, but we do carry devices. So grab that. Always, 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 always bring your Bible to church. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Pastor Dan's word for it. Hey, listen, don't even take Pastor Jim's word for it. You get in the Bible. You read the Bible for yourself and listen to what's being said. And I'll tell you what, that is when life really takes off. So what we've been doing, for those of you that are joining us or um, coming, coming and hanging out with us today, we go through the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible is written that way. We study it that way. So here we are in the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. So if you got your Bibles, go to me the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. We are on an amazing, amazing portion of Scripture. I like to call it the icing on the cake, if that makes any sense. And I'll explain that a little bit further in just a moment. The title of, of this morning's message is Entering the Holiest or the Presence of God. We're going to look at some amazing scripture out of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and we're going to shed some light on what it is to enter into the holiest and specifically with some boldness or some, some expectations going before God. So in Hebrews in the 10th chapter, starting in verse number 19, Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 19, it says, therefore, got to stop right there. Can't go any further than that. All right. Whenever you see therefore in the Bible, we always say it like this at the rock. It's there for a reason. Now, oftentimes what happens is when we go through the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, we take our time and we savor the scripture and we savor the statement and the phrase and we focus in on the heart of the message. Oftentimes what happens is that we kind of lose sight of the big picture at hand, or you can even say it like this, you lose sight of the forest through the trees. So as it's saying, therefore, the author of Hebrews is saying, therefore, I want to just take a quick moment and back up and let's just take a broad look at the forest for a moment. And I'm going to explain it like this. Has anybody ever had or seen one of those really nice, beautifully decorated multi-layer cakes? You know what I'm talking about? There's that, there's that restaurant right down the street in San Bernardino, uh, the Claim Jumper. They got that one piece of cake. You've seen it maybe even in the store. It's got like seven layers of like chocolate on You know what I'm talking about? I think they even call it like the Widowmaker or something like that because if you eat it, you're going to die, right? 
I think Hebrews, the 10th chapter, is really like when I said the icing on the cake. It's because basically the book of Hebrews, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible doesn't afford us or give us the author, but we know that the author, the true author of the book of Hebrews is the Holy Spirit. And so the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Hebrews essentially is laying down layer upon layer of theology for us to understand. And when we look at the grand picture of it, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, really takes all of that which we've learned already already and we've seen and we and we tie it all together and it becomes the icing on the cake. So let me give you a real quick, just a real quick overview. Hebrews in the first chapter, beginning there, you're like, man, some of you are like, man, Pastor Luke, I don't even remember when we were started in Hebrews. I didn't even go to this church when we started in Hebrews. It's all right. It's all good. Hebrews in the first chapter paints the picture of Jesus being the highest, elevated to a high and mighty position above the angels. And then the Hebrews in the second chapter brings this new image of Jesus Christ as being brought down or being low, brought lower than the angels for our sakes, for our salvation. Hebrews in the third chapter is a call to faithfulness to remain in the faithfulness of God, giving the examples of the Hebrews and the children of Israel who, who were through the hardness of their heart or they, the Bible refers to them as stiff neck, turned away from God. Hebrews in the fourth chapter begins to paint the picture that if you remain faithful, that the promise of God for rest in your life, godly rest, godly peace will come your way. And we can go before the Lord God understanding these promises. Hebrews chapter 5 begins to compare Jesus Christ as our representative, or we'll say high priest, in comparison to a man named Aaron. Aaron was the very first high priest in the Bible, and so the Bible gives us a comparison as to why Jesus is like Aaron and the high priest. Now, Hebrews in the 6th chapter is very important. The reason is, Hebrews in the 6th chapter encourages us and challenges us, us the church, to no longer hold on to or stay at the immature level of understanding but rather each and every day of our lives to begin to, to continue and, and grow in the knowledge of the things of God, leaving the elementary principles behind, it tells us. It begins to focus on more complex principles. It's so important. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, is important to tell us that because Hebrews 7 starts to introduce these complex um, thoughts in our lives. And so Hebrews chapter 7, again, brings Jesus as our great high priest, but now removing the man of Aaron and comparing him to a man named Melchizedek, who is a little bit of a mysterious person in the Bible, but showing us that Jesus is our high priest, but he is better, a better priest than mankind, a better priest than the lineage of man. Hebrews chapter 8 begins to talk about the promise and the covenant, showing us what the old promise was and showing us that now that there is a new and a better promise for you and I. So Hebrews 7, a better priest. Hebrews 8, a better promise. Hebrews chapter 9 begins to show us the temple, the, the tabernacle, the, the presence and the dwelling place of God, the significance of the sacrifice, the weight of our sin, and what it cost for us to be redeemed, and showing that Jesus is not only our priest, but he is now our sacrifice as well. And it paints this picture, and it continues to draw this out, so that now in Hebrews, in the 10th chapter, they can he can round everything together and begin to put the icing on the cake and show us that everything that was explained to you and I through the process of the book of Hebrews is all coming into one common theme. And here we find it in this portion of scripture, Hebrews the 10th chapter, verse number 19 through the 23rd chapter, really, but today we'll read through or verse number 22. Uh, so Hebrews the 19th chapter, so we've gotten through therefore. Wow. Whew. All right, we can move on. So therefore, brethren, I love this, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to read through the statement here, the sentence that so we can see this in the, the entire context. Having boldness to enter the holiest through blo the blood of Jesus, verse number 20 goes on and the continuing statement says, by a new and living way, which he, speaking of Jesus, consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Remember, the veil was that curtain that blocked access to the presence of God, the holy place of God. Having a high priest over the house of God. Verse number 22 goes on and it says, Let us draw near with a true heart 
in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There are two major statements today that I want to focus in on. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 19, and Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 22. Focusing in on entering in the holiest with boldness. Thou let us therefore come boldly into the holiest, the presence of God, the dwelling place of God. There's another theme that says, let us with a full assurance draw near to God. God's desire is for us to be close to him. And I want to show some things to you. We talked about boldness last week. Pastor Dan brought a great message about living a bold life. I'll tell you what, when you make points that rhyme, you remember them last week. If you want to live a Christian life, you got to pray, stay and obey. Hallelujah. Amen. Today, I want to take a look at boldness in before entering the presence of God or the holiest place, the place where God dwells. Now, before we go there, I got to, I got to, explain some things. I got to talk to you a little bit. Okay. Oftentimes in our day, in our vocabulary, the way we speak, the way we talk, when we look at boldness, we say things like, wow, that was a bold move. Or, you know, somebody's playing and they, they have a sports game or a football team and they, they make a, 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 a Hail Mary type, you know, that was a bold play. It was, it was over and above, or that was a bold statement, or man, that guy is just a really bold guy. Oftentimes what happens is we see bold as uh, a, a corresponding with a word that we use as arrogance. Boldness, sometimes you see somebody who's bold, they'll just say, I'm going to tell you like it is. I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to let you know how I feel. And you're like, man, sometimes I wish you would not be so bold. So what I want to do is I want to lay the foundation of what this word boldness means because the worst thing you and I could do is mistake the way we see boldness in our day and age as arrogance because it does not say, listen, it does not say, let us therefore arrogantly enter the holiest. The worst thing you and I could ever do is enter the presence of God or go before God in our hearts and in our lives with a sense of arrogance saying, well, God, listen here, you need to understand that you, and, and start telling God what we think God needs to know about life. Because as we've seen over and over and over again, the Bible tells us that God resists the proud. I don't know about you, but if there's any place I do not want to be resisted by God in, it's the holiest or the presence of God. I want to be there all the time. So the Bible tells us to have boldness. Well, what does boldness mean? Let me tell you what the Greek word is. I'm not even going to put it on the overhead because you're going to be like, Pastor Luke, you're teaching me Greek today. I'm just going to tell it to you so that you know I studied it. All right. The Greek word is parasea, parasea, which in, when it's translated in the original translation, the King James Version, we see it translated in this, these different ways. It's often precluded with or goes before or after the words saying spoke or rebuked or thought or made open or, or made known. These words openly, boldly, plainly, freely. It comes in as a translation of boldness or it also comes as the translation or the word we use as confidence. So boldness does not mean arrogance, but rather boldness as defined. This Greek word means literally to speak or to, to, made, to be made known or to think without concealment, to speak frankly, without ambiguity, without beating around the bush, without the metaphoric or making illustrations or examples to make the point. Boldness literally means to come with a fearless confidence, with a cheerful courage or to come with assurance, something backing you behind it. So boldness never translates to arrogance in the word of God, but simply put, it means that we have the ability to speak without ambiguity, without having to worry about going around the bush or, or making it known in another way, but rather we can say it like it is to say it how we are, but it does not give us the right to go before God with arrogance or with pride in our lives. You see, the thing is, is that oftentimes in our lives, we don't understand the, the gravity or the, the weight of the statement that, uh, that affords us to enter the presence of God. Why? Because each and every person in this building, from the moment you were born till right now, the access to the presence of God to you has been open. 
But you see, it was not always this way. Let me show you what it was like years and years and years ago. In the Bible, there's a book, a personal account of a young man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah served as the wine bearer to a great Babylonian king uh, by the name of Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes was uh, on his throne, and Nehemiah was his responsibility was to give the king his wine upon request. He was a wine bearer or a cupbearer. So Nehemiah is in the presence in the throne room of this great and powerful king. And as he gives the king his wine, the king looks to Nehemiah and sees on his face. You know, sometimes people just wear their emotions on the outside. The king sees on Nehemiah's face that he is sad or that something is wrong with him. So the king says to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, there's, there's, what is there to be sad about? Whatever I see on your face, clearly I see that you have a heavy heart. Now that's to you and I says, well, cool, that's great. The king is concerned about him. He wants to know. Nehemiah, in his own personal words, says that he was covered or he came, a great terror came upon him because the king recognized in his presence that Nehemiah was sad. Because in this time, in this day, if you were in the presence of the king, it was never about you. It was never about how you felt, how you thought, what your opinion was, what your needs were. It was always about the king. And a person in a position of Nehemiah, who was essentially a slave to the king, the king could say, I'm not happy with you. I'm no longer pleased with you. You have not done your job according to what I said. You can go. You could go to prison. You could die. And, and he could remove Nehemiah at any whim he wanted. So Nehemiah was covered in great terror because he realized that the king had seen his, or his, his emotions. But you see, no longer is it that way with God that we go before God and, and have, to, have to not worry about you know, what we have to say to God and not have to worry about, oh, if the Lord asks me, what does it need? That, oh my goodness, I'm so afraid of God. No, the Bible says that we can come with a cheerful confidence as a child who goes into his parents' house and says, Dad, Mom, I need something. I need your help. A child who knows that they have a position with God. You and I now come because of Jesus Christ. We have access to the presence of God. God, the holiest place that was closed off to mankind. Only one man, one day a year, the priest could go into the presence of God and he must go with a sacrifice. He could not go alone. But now we have been given this great gift. Now I say all that to tell you this, that unless we understand the value of something, we don't know how properly to treat it. I'm, I'm a nerd, so I like the PBS TV show. Anybody, some of you might know it. I like the PBS TV show, Antiques Roadshow. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyone seen that? You're like, man, that's the one that I, if I'm flipping through the channels, I push the button faster on that one. And that's for people that, you know, somebody has been giving something to them or, or they, you know, they, they, they come and they sit down and there's a professional there and they say, you know, my grandfather was in Italy or something like that and he was at a flea market and he bought this for five cents and it's just been passed down through the family for years and years and years. And so now there's this professional, this person that knows about this and they look at this vase or they look at that painting and they, they turn it over and they say, well, do you see this mark or do you see these lines? And this is actually, was this, this vase was made by a, a company you may have heard of by Tiffany or, or that painting was, was painted by, by a, a Picasso, but it wasn't something known. And, and all of a sudden, at the end of that, the little the discourse, they say, well, I would, I would conservatively give you a value of $15,000 or $100,000 or $4,000, whatever it might be. And the person, every time without fail, they're always just like, oh. <laughs> did you know that when they went home and they took that vase or they took that painting, when they went home and they put it back on the display in their, in their china cabinet or on their wall, did you know that they, they put it a little bit more on. carefully on... on, on Right? You know, they kind of, you know, you set something down and you kind of take your hands away like, okay, okay, you know. Or the painting, if it was over the mantle and they got little kids at home, you know, they, they, they took the painting off right there because they didn't want the, the ball or the soccer ball or something to come and hit that priceless painting off and ruin it. You see, all of a sudden, when they realized what the value of what they had was, then they knew how to treat it and they knew what they were holding on to. When you and I realize the value of this statement that we have boldness to enter the presence of God in our lives, now we really understand the gravity and how to treat this in our lives and how to go before God and we realize what we have been given and how we are blessed in our lives. Are you with me today? So we are granted access to God. Think about it just for a moment. Creator God, the one who holds the universe in his hands, the one that strung the stars out, that spoke and planets existed. Now God says, you have open access to me 
personally. And I expect you or I'm asking you or I'm telling you that when you come into the presence or when you come into my presence, I am telling you to come in with a cheerful confidence, with an assurance, with an expectation. I'm giving you the right and the ability, unlike Nehemiah who was covered in terror, uh, to, to, to speak to me frankly, to openly, to tell me what it is that you need, as the Bible says, to make our requests or our petitions made known to him. We have been given access to God. Now, what does giving or having access to God bring for you and I? Today, I want to give you three simple things in just the next 10 or 15 minutes. Three simple thoughts of what the access to God brings us in our lives. Can we, can we, can we talk this morning? Can I give you three simple things today? The access of God brings us, number one today, communion. I know 85% of you are probably like, I know what communion is. It's that little grape juice cup and it's the wafer. So the access to God lets me have grape juice and bread. We call that the communion service, but let, let, let's, let's look at what communion really is. That, that's the Lord's Supper. Communion goes so much further, church, than grape juice and, or wine and bread. Communion goes so much further. Let me tell you, let me give you the definition of what communion is so that we can fully understand what the access of God gives to us. Communion is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. I love this. Takes it one step further by saying, with especially with the exchange, when the exchange is in the mental or the spiritual level. Communion is the exchanging or the sharing of intimate feelings or thoughts, especially when that exchange is on the mental or the spiritual level. You know what the really neat thing about that definition is, is the understanding of what it is. There are two words that we have got to understand, sharing and exchange. You see, sharing is a two-way road. Exchange is a two-way road. So not only have we been given granted access to God to go before God and to share with God our most intimate feelings, our most intimate thoughts, our most intimate desires and dreams, but now we have a boldness, a confidence, an assurance that as we go before God, that as we develop communion and intimate relationship with God, that God himself will also share with us his feelings, his thoughts towards us and towards our lives. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Many of you know that. The Bible says, God says that, for I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. You cannot be after God's own heart unless you know what God's heart is about. And you see, there's an exchange in communion of going before God and hearing the voice of God and sharing with God our needs, but hearing also God's desire for us. A relationship relationship or a position with God. How neat is that? Uh, I have a friend. He, he just, he, he, he's, he's, he's just got a girlfriend. All right. So he's telling us about, you know, going on this date with a girlfriend. I, I guess, I guess they're not boyfriend and girlfriend, but they're, they're, they're going on dates. Okay. So we were talking and we were kind of like, all right, how'd it go? You know, we've been, we were kind of like, man, I hope this dude someday gets a wife someday, please Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> So we were asking, you know, like, okay, tell, tell, how did it go? Tell me about it, you know? And he's like, okay. So he tells us about his date. And I think it was like his second or his third date. And he says, yeah, you know, we went out and we went to the beach and we were rocking, rocking on the beach. It was really neat. We were just having a good time just talking. And he says, and he says, as we were walking, her hand just kind of brushed my hand. And he was kind of like, ooh, you know, <laughs> what do I do? And he was like, I didn't know. Was, was that a sign? Was that a signal? And then we were talking, well, okay, what else? And then we went out to dinner and we were sitting there and, and I was sitting there and my hand was on the table and, and she was talking and all of a sudden her fingers laid on top of my fingers and I was kind of like, whoa. And he's like, I didn't know. Was that, the top? was that a sign? Like, am I supposed to hold her hand? Did she want me to? Did, or, did I, you know, I don't want to move too fast. And, and, and then she's going to be like, hey man, slow down. Or I didn't want to move too slow. And she's like, this guy's a deadbeat. He's like, what do I do? And my wife and I, as he was telling the story, we were just laughing at each other because, I mean, I married my junior high sweetheart. So it's been a long time since Stacy and I have experienced not knowing what to do. I mean, when I want to hold Stacy's hand, I hold her hand. I don't have to worry, like, is this the right time? When, when we're at the movie theaters, when we're, I don't have to do the whole, you know, oh, oh, you know, kind of, I, I could just do it. When I want a kiss from my wife, I grab her and say, come here, girl. It's time. I don't have to worry. 
But you see, communion is just that. As you advance in your relationship, as you share intimate feelings and intimate thoughts together, you begin to progress in this relationship and you begin to understand and begin to know each other more and more and more and you become more comfortable. And this term boldness, now you begin to understand that I have this communion with God and now I can go before God because I know how he feels for me. I know how he cares for me. I know his desires for me. I know his plans for me. And we begin to see this relationship Relationship, this position we are given by access to God. Jesus tells us in Revelation, the third chapter, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, doesn't that sound like a date? The, 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 the boy is coming, he's knocking on the door, he's got flowers in hand. The girl's got to answer the door before the date begins. And he says, If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. When you go out and when you're dating, when you're having an intimate conversation over dinner, you know that the dinner lasts much longer than it takes to eat. Why? Because you're conversing, you're sharing, you're getting to know each other. And Jesus is saying, church, my desire is to know you on a greater level, but not just to know you, but for you to know me on a greater level, to know my heart, my desires, my intentions for you. And God's desire is for us to be in communion with him. Are you with me this morning? The access of God, number two. The access of God brings for us, number two, direction. Direction. When we go and we develop this communion and this relationship and this position with God, we have been granted the, the opportunity and the ability to hear the voice of God and to hear the direction of God. I don't know if you understand this, but it is God's desire for each and every one of us to know our plan and know our desire, know God's plan for our lives. One of the things as a pastor, one of the greatest requests I get, one of the most common or most frequent requests I get for people is, Pastor Luke, will you pray for me? What for? I need direction. I need wisdom. I need guidance. Pastor Luke, I don't know what to do about this. I need healing. What does the Bible say? What is the, what, and every time when somebody sits down in my office, I tell them, I say, listen, here's the deal. As a shepherd to a sheep, that's what the Bible refers to pastors as, I cannot make you lay down by still waters. I cannot make you drink or eat. Simply put, all I can do is my job is to guide you with the staff and with the rod is to guide you to the place that you need to be and trust that through the guidance that you would hear the word of God and see the word of God and that you would partake of the still waters and you would lie down and that you would eat what needs to be done. So here God's desire for us church is to know the directions of our lives. We, God is not, his plan for us is to not walk about as though blindfolded, groping in the dark, hoping that we might find an answer. God, I need a direction. God, I need an illness. And all of a sudden, oh, 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 there, there's something that must be God but God says God's desire for us is to have direction to have answer to have a path that we should take in our lives the Bible tells us Jesus gives us the job description of the Holy Spirit I'll go ahead and put it up in the book of John Jesus tells us in John the 16th chapter that the spirit of truth when he comes will guide you into all truth the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. The Bible tells us that we are to be led by the Spirit. God's desire for us is to know His plans. I finally got around, oh my, to watching a movie that, based on the title of the movie, I'll give it that much, based on the title of the movie, one might think it was inspired by something that's in the Bible. It's Noah. All right, now. I had heard a lot of pastors recommending that the church go see, and I'm trying to figure out as I'm watching this, why would anybody on earth recommend this? But I found out at the end of the movie that the recommendation comes because about three quarters of the way through the movie, I couldn't take it any longer, and I went and grabbed my Bible, opened it up to Genesis, the eighth chapter, and it was like, I got to read the Bible. So if anything, I can see why pastors say, go watch Noah, because it'll make you read your Bible. Because I'm reading Genesis, like, I don't remember rock guys. I don't remember stowaways. I don't remember warriors and swords and mining some magic fire rock. I, I, I don't remember. You see, but in the movie, it depicts this, this, this man. The Bible says Noah walked with God. 
The Bible tells us that Noah was in a position of righteousness, but Hollywood depicts this as a, this, they refer to God as the creator and they would speak and they would say, why don't you answer me? Why don't you respond? And Noah came about in the movie as though the, the, the God was floating through a dream and he didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until he went to his grandfather. I know, spoil alert. He went to his grandfather and he got some magical potion and the magical potion made him see. The reality is, is, guys, God is there to answer you and I when we ask because we have been granted access to God. If you go back and read what the Bible says about Noah, the Bible says that Noah was a righteous man who walked with God, and God said to Noah, Noah, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives will build an ark. And he said, get in there. And God laid out the plan for the ark. It wasn't a guessing game. So God's desire for us is to have direction. If there's anything in the Bible that shows us the direction of the Holy Spirit, the leading, showing of things to come, of being led by the Spirit, there's a man in the Bible, you may have heard of him. His name was Paul. Anybody ever heard of the man by the name of Paul, the apostle in the Bible? Some of you are like, no, I'm not. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you about him right now. Paul was a man who had communion with God. He was in communion with God. How do we know this? Well, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So what you're reading in the Bible in the New Testament is more, more than likely the writings of Paul. So here's a man by the name of Paul, and he's desiring to go and minister in different places. Look what it says in Acts, the 16th chapter. Paul, or they're speaking about Paul, and it says, now when they had gone to, oh gosh, I wrote this down phonetically because I don't want to butcher it for you, so let me just tell you. For Phrygia, all right, thank you, I got it. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. What? Did the Holy Spirit not hear the great commission of Jesus? Didn't Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of every nation? So why, if they wanted to go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, did the Holy Spirit stop them? Let's see, let's read further. So verse number seven, it goes on. After they come to Mysia, they came to, into Bithynia. Bithynia, and the Spirit did not permit them. They met opposition by the Holy Spirit. Verse number eight goes on and says, so by passing my, by Myasa, they came to Troas. And in Troas, Paul has a vision. Look what it says, verse number nine. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and beckoned him or pleaded with him saying, come to Macedonia and help us. Clear and precise directions from the Holy Spirit to Paul saying, Paul, this is the location on the map. This is the job I need you to do in Macedonia to help them. So Paul, the Bible goes on and says, well, verse number 10, it says, after that, they had seen the vision. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord called us to preach the gospel to them. It was God's plan that Paul teach to Macedonia or to the European continent, not into Asia, because listen to this. It is his Paul's first experience or encounter on the European continent. There, they are in a city called Philippi. They come across a woman who sells purple. Her name is Lydia. Lydia was there by the river. They sit with Lydia and they begin to talk to her. And Lydia is the very first convert of the gospel of Jesus Christ recorded in the Bible on the European continent. Wow, that's neat. Here's more to it. God has a plan. Did you know, did you know that it was Europe, not Jerusalem, not Alexandria, not Cairo, not Ephesus, not any of the churches in the Asia Minor area, but it was Europe that was the catalyst for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spread globally across the world some centuries later. It is from Europe we have the Bible today. It was in Europe the Bible was printed. It was in Europe that, that the church was established. Why? Because God had a plan and God knew that Europe was the continent that needed to be converted so that Christianity would succeed across the world. And Paul was the man to deliver the first convert recorded in the Bible to Europe. Why? Because he listened and was led by the Holy Spirit. He was given direction in his life. <clears throat> My good friends on the front row, I'll give him the credit for saying this. Uh, in one of our young adult service, man by the little, that guy over there by the name of Antonio said, God's directions are always clear, but they don't always make sense. 
They're always clear, but they may, may not make sense. But that's where the direction of God is, just to follow and to follow in faith because we have access to God. Last one for today. Can you handle one more? Uno mas? Si? Yes? Okay. Last one for today, talking about the, uh, uh, the access to God gives us or brings us. Number three today, assistance. Oh, what a great, what a great statement. The access to God gives to you and I assistance. You know, if anything to be taken out of this, to understand this, that you are never alone. Despite the highest and the lowest moments of life, you and I are never alone. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we have been, the law has been written upon our hearts. The temple has been moved. No longer do we have to fly and land in Jerusalem, go into the temple and ask the high priest to, to make our plead before God. But now the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Lord is on the inside of us. Everywhere we go, we carry the very presence of God and we are never alone. And God is our help, our assistance in our time of need. Praise God. Hallelujah for that one. Amen. Look what it says in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Very familiar verse because we're just, we're basically reading the same thing. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. What an interesting statement. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't remember this. I didn't even go to church when we were in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Cool. Here you are today. We've already talked about it once before, talking about boldness before God. But you see, it says we can come boldly with confidence, with a great expectation, with assurance to the throne of what? Grace. Grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Grace is God's assistance to us when we are incapable of doing the job. We we can go boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are never alone. We have God Almighty on our side to help us when we need. The cool thing is I think of it like this as a child to his parents. You know, the parents are there to help, to offer assistance. I remember I was in, I was in middle school and there was this boy. His name was Matt. He lived down the street and he picked on me. And at the bus stop one day, Matt punched me. And I came home and I was in the kitchen. I, I, I remember vividly. I came home and I was in the kitchen and mom saw my face. You know, moms have that way of just pulling it out. What happened? <laughs> you know. So dad comes, what happened? What happened? And I tell him, Matt punched me. And right there, Pastor Jim, he gave me a discourse and he showed me as a parent giving assistance and guidance. He told me that Jesus says to turn the other cheek. And if Matt punches you, give him your jacket. Give him your bed. No, he didn't say that. You know what he said? He said, come with me. We're going to go outside. We went outside and he said, put your hands up. So I put my hands up. He said, make a fist like this. And he said, all right. And he says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to, this is called a jab. And he said, this is called a cross. And this is called an uppercut. And he says, if Matt comes at you again, remember what I taught you. He says, if Matt comes at you again, you give him a jab to the nose, a cross to the cheek, and an uppercut to the chin. And I promise you, he will leave you alone. Alone. Guess what? God, through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit says, church, this is a jab. Church, this is a cross. Church, this is an uppercut. Church, this is a judo kick in the cheap spot. Because guess what? The devil's going to come your way. But God has given you the assistance that you need, the deliverance, the help, the mercy in your time of need because we have access to God. I preach myself happy right about there. So now when the Bible says we have access to God and that we come boldly before God, now we understand. It does not mean that we kick down the doors of heaven and say, God, let me tell you. But it says that we know now we can go before God like a child to his parent. It says, God, I have a relationship with you. When my wife comes to me, I tell her all the time, I say, girl, I don't ever tell you no. She wants something. She's like, look, babe, can I Just get it? It's God's the same way we come before. As we develop this, com this relationship with God, access to God brings us communion, which gives us an intimate relationship and puts us in a position of understanding God. Access to God gives us direction in our lives. We don't have to grope about wondering, God, why don't you answer me? God will answer you. And we have been given assistance to find and go boldly before the throne of grace to get mercy and help in time of need. God will teach us how to judo chop. The devil. Amen. Did you guys get something out of that today? Praise 
the Lord. Listen, really quickly, one last thing I want to do. It would be a shame for us to, to come together and to have praise and worship and to hear the word of God and to hoot and holler and talk about the access to God and, and leave with the assumption that every person in this building or in this auditorium is in the right place with God when, when there are many of, many of us in this place or many of you in this place that might not be there. And I don't want to leave without letting you or making sure today. So I want to ask you a question. I want each and every person to answer this within their heart. Nobody would know this answer except you and God, not even the person that knows you the most intimately. Only you and God, if you were to leave today and your heart were to stop beating and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Very simple question. You might say, well, you know, I want to get to heaven or I'm going to get to heaven. Let me ask you one step further. What makes you so sure? Well, you know, you might say, well, I hope I'll get to heaven. I want to get to heaven. I think I'm going to get to heaven. I have expectation that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Can I, can I love you enough and respect you enough to tell you the truth? That nowhere in the Bible would you find that because you want to? Because you hope so, because you believe so, or because you expect that you're going to go to heaven when you die, that you're going to get there. You can't get to heaven based on your own thoughts or your own hopes or wishes or positive outlook on life. You can't get to heaven that way. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you as a child that you were a Christian, because you went to Sunday school or catechism classes? Did you know that nowhere does it say that because you went to youth group or youth camp or children's camp or anything like that, that you're going to get to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You know, you can't get to heaven because you sit in church, because you come on Christmas and on Easter, here you are today, attending church. You say, man, if I attend enough, I'll get my gold star and God will let me into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, because you listen to the pastor preach, because you sing in the choir, because you volunteer in the children's ministry or carry the pastor's Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church or are involved in church, that means you're going to get into heaven. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough to tell you the truth. For so many years, we've believed that, well, if I'm a good person, I do good things. I've never cheated on my taxes. I don't rob the 7-Eleven. I do more good in my life than bad. I've even given to charitable, charitable organizations. Good people go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God, nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you're good, you're going to get into heaven? But you will find that the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because it's God's heaven. The only way to get into God's heaven is God's way. And his standard is perfection. But the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means every one of us does not meet that standard by default. So how do we get to heaven? Well, we can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in the book of John in the third chapter, speaking to a man who was a religious leader or a Pharisee, the Bible tells us, an educated man in the Bible, a man who did all the right things and said all the right things according to the word of God, a man who gave to the poor, a man who taught in the synagogue or the church of his day. He says to this man, Nicodemus, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. Wow, what does born again mean? You've heard of Hollywood and society's definition of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity, but clearly as we see from what Hollywood's perspective on God is that they have no concept. May we never define something as eternal as salvation by something as so fickle as, as society. Let me tell you what born again means in the, in the eyes of God. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe who Jesus Christ is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Listen, today you sang a song and you wholeheartedly believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in the crucifixion, in the resurrection, that he's coming again. I understand that you believe and sing that. You say, well, I'm good. But let me share with you, the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because the Bible tells us that our belief is unto righteousness, which means that our belief is so moving in our lives that it causes us to become like Jesus Christ. Let me say it to you like this. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove that to you. The Bible says in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we were just there today. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church people like you and I. And Jesus says, listen, he says he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he says he will vomit us from our mouth. And what Jesus Christ is saying is I better find you all in or all out. Because if you're just in the middle, right there in the middle, riding the fence, a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, token prayer here and again, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. He says, if I find you in that position, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it and you will be rejected and ejected, counted as waste from the kingdom of God. 
So today, let me, let me afford you the opportunity today to, to ensure your place with, with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. You say, Pastor, look, I'm not even sure about heaven or hell. Let me tell you something. Just because you can't see it or can't feel it doesn't mean it's not real. Come on, we know that. We see that all day long. You know right now that there are radio waves going from me to the sound with because you can hear the sound of my voice to this microphone, but you don't see them. You don't feel them. Listen, God's not in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to whack you over the head. He's not a kid on an anthill waiting to burn you up for the mistakes that you've made. God loved you so much so that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross. And in return, he wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. So in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. And as I do, I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud like that. Bam! And when I do, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pop your hand up. And I want you to do it with pride. Be bold about it. Say, hey, man, that's me. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, today I want to give God my heart. Today I want to give him my life. I want, I want to make sure today I want to get into heaven. Pastor Luca, I, I want to be saved today. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, I'm a man. I'll confess you before my father, he says. He says, but if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. The decision is yours. He's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And he already did everything he could to ensure your eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a gift for you to accept. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you've never given him your heart. You've never given him your life. In just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you're not sure. You did this at a child or in the youth group. Maybe you did it at a Harvest or Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through. Listen, don't walk out of this place today without making sure your position with God. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You've been running from God instead of to God, or you've been saying it like this. You're not wholehearted against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. You're right in the middle. That's a bad place to be. And Jesus says, if that's you, come on. In just a moment, this is your moment. Today is your day. This is the moment of your salvation. It's a divine appointment with God with you right now. You've got doctor's appointments. You've got DMV appointments. You've got dentist appointments. You know what appointments are. And today is a divine appointment with God for you right now. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count all across this auditorium, wherever you're at. Listen, if you're in the front row, the back row, family rooms over there, you guys hear the sound of my voice. If you're lit, watching on the, around the campus by, by television or hear the sound of my voice or online, at home, whatever you're doing, in the Love Rock Cafe, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. When I do, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Say, Pastor Luke, I might be embarrassed. Listen, let me encourage you to get over that moment of embarrassment, even if you think you might be embarrassed, because this is the best decision you could ever make. And let's make the decision today, move forward for your relationship with God, leaving hell behind and going forward for God, having that access that we talked about today. So all across this auditorium, I'm going to count. If that's you, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. All across this auditorium. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. I see that. One, two, three. I see that hand. Four. I see that hand. Five, I see that hand right back there. Six, I see that hand. Seven, I see that hand in the family room. That's one in the family room. Seven in the family room. Anybody else? I see ushers pointing right over here. I got that hand right there. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place today? I got you. Nine, I got you right there. Ten, I see you right there. Ten wise people. Anybody else in this place today? If I saw your hand, you can put it down. Anybody else? Give me a little bit of a wave. Give me a little bit of a something so I can see if that's you. Make sure I see it. Anybody else in this place today say, man, I want to. I see people waving right over here. I got you. Number 11, 12. I think I'm somewhere in 11. Well, hey, praise. Well, where, I see I got that hand already. Well, hey, praise God for 11 or 12 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do for every one of you. So it doesn't matter if you're five years old or 55 years old or 105 years old. It's never too late. For those of you that raised your hand or those of you that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, hey, shame on you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. Say, I want to get saved. Now you get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. We're going to do some things. We're going to pray. We're going to get some information in your hands. I want to come and congratulate you. I want to shake your hand. So in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. As I do, please, nobody leave. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, get out of your seat. Get out of your aisle, out of the aisle. Get out and meet me right here at the altar. We're going to shake hands. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. Come on, if, they, if that's you, let's all stand. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Family rooms, wherever you're at, the ushers will help you. Come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Meet me right here, right now.
congratulations. Thank you guys. Come on, it's, it's not too late. Hey, right on, And if you're still coming, come on, we'll wait for you. It's all right. Here's the deal. I want to tell you something. First of all, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is a good day. You can smile and rejoice today. You're going to be born again. It's your new birthday. All right, praise God. Listen, here's what I want to do. I want to share something with you. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. He's going to take you guys right over there. Listen, I promise nothing weird goes on. I am as weird as it gets in this church. Pastor Dan may be a little bit weirder with his socks, but other than that, you've already made it through everything else. He's going to take you right over there, and he's going to lead you in a prayer, okay? Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. All right, you're going to walk out of this place and say, man, what do I do now? We're going to point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to offer to you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. Somebody that will sit with you before church. They'll sit down and buy you a cup of coffee. For five weeks, they'll teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that gets you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from and you go forward for everything that God has in store for you. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right. Go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.